Hello everyone and welcome back to the Genshin Impact Prelude series. As I've said before, this is a series all about the backstories of the playable characters in Genshin Impact. I will only be going to the stories in the character pages, so there may be potential story spoilers for some characters. This also means I won't be going to the manga or story unless their events are mentioned in the character stories. Also, if you like this video, consider subscribing. It helps me out a lot and I'd really appreciate it. Anyways, today's video is all about Yaimiko, so sit back and relax as I read you her stories. The Head Shrine Maiden of the Grand Narukami Shrine, descendant of Hakushin's lineage, Eternity's servant and friend, and the intimidating editor-in-chief of Yai Publishing House, a publisher of light novels. Come to think of it, Yai Miko's nicknames are as myriad as her changeable moods. The number of people who have tried to figure her out for various reasons could fill the streets from the Tenryo Commission estate to Yai Publishing House if you were to line them all up. But to this day, very few indeed have succeeded. Not that Miko has ever intended to conceal anything, of course. Any capriciousness is but the result of doing as she wills and pleases. A riddle with no solution is no riddle at all in any case. You just need to remember that she will always be none other than the wise and beautiful Yai Miko. Yai Publishing House's editors once submitted a certain manuscript to the editor-in-chief. This work was well written, clearly thought out, and the themes were romance with a side of comedy, a prime slice of the zeitgeist. Such a gem would surely require but a thin coat of polish and a few beautiful illustrations to sell well. But unexpectedly, Yai Miko did not seem pleased with this, instead heaving a deep sigh before calling for the various head editors. One of them asked hesitantly, Lady Yai, well, I did ask him to write on this topic, yes, but isn't this the hot genre of the day? Faced with the editor's doubtful gaze, Miko gave her opinion forthrightly. That a book that should have been interesting yet was shackled at every turn by the topic was, simply put, not free enough. Things like top sellers, genre fiction, these were not but fads that would come and go every decade. Getting with the times was a shortcut, yes. But if a work had the quality that could surmount this tide, why go with the flow nonetheless? Pass this message to this new author of ours. Tell him that there's no need to bother about genre. He just needs to write his story and write it well. Upon hearing this, the author stopped writing for a time, as if suddenly having an epiphany. Several months later, a new manuscript was sent to Miko and her editors. The latter were stunned, and even Yai Miko, who cared little about taboos, furrowed her brows slightly, a rare sight indeed. Um, what did we do? This isn't good. Exactly. I mean, there's not being concerned about genre, and then there's something like Shogun Almighty reborn as Raiden. This is just too much. Hmm? Genre? No, no, there's no problem with that. It's his pen name I'm worried about. It's too normal for a book like this. Huh, so that was what you were concerned about. Uh, no, uh, never mind, as long as you're happy, Lady I. Not long after, the author of this book would take to the literary stage with the Yai Miko approved, and overly long, pen name, Kaine no Koji Kenzabaru. As to how the editor-in-chief got the idea to start a Reborn as Gujiai writing submission event, that would be a tale for a later day. If there was something inconvenient about being the Guji, it is that she must attend every shrine ceremony, dressed up to the nines and in her proper place in the sanctuary. The fireworks paint the night skies as they blossom and the sounds of human merriment fill the shrine. And yet, she must sit within, a solemn smile on her face. Such tragedies are even more frightful to Miko 
than the possible wholesale disappearance of fried tofu from Devad. With the somewhat longer span of years that the Electro Archon Servant have, a hundred years pass in the blink of an eye. As the years fly by, boredom becomes the greatest foe. And if she ever were, Archon forbid, one day to accept sitting quietly still, obstinate as Deadwood, would the world now sorely lack for another clever person adept at discovering fun and grasping opportunity? As such, looking for fun things to do in every nook and cranny can only be the most reasonable and necessary course. And if she were to say, utilize her authority as Gucci in making fun things happen, why, some things are unavoidable, are they not? On the day of the festival, Guji I would nod in satisfaction as she received a delivery of fireworks from the Ashro Commission, of Naganohara construction and specially made to boot. That night's ceremony was, of course, performed with perfect respect to all etiquette and rites. The sight of the Lady Guji kneeling gracefully the whole night through would be the object of awe for all the other shrine maidens. In the meantime, she would sit beneath the meteor shower of light adorning the skies, watching the festival goers as they came and went. And the din of the fireworks covered the mumbling that came between teeth chewing on a candy apple. You know, when you asked me to become Guji, you never mentioned that I'd only ever be able to sneak outside to watch the festivities from then on. Pursuing fun and finding happiness is how Miko lives her everyday life. For someone who enjoys studying humanity like her, perspectives and virtue play distant second fiddles to fun. Even a great shrine maiden of a different faith or an enemy general might pique her interest. That said, this appreciation can sometimes lead to some innocuous trouble. As opposed to these conscientious utterlings of worshipful juniors, Miko's favorite person at the shrine is a shrine maiden named Kanonana. Yes, that Kanonana, the novel enthusiast, just like Miko, who constantly fret over Sayu. While laying about indoors, Miko would often see Sayu flash past the window, followed not long after by a hurried and angry Kanonana. Like lightning and thunder they were, which caught Miko's attention, to the point where she would even sometimes give wrong directions just to let the ruckus go on for a little longer. There was another time when Sayu told Miko that the afternoon sun was the most pleasant after the latter had helped her steal some time for napping. Perhaps encouraged by these words, Miko would transform into an ordinary Inazuma lady on a wonderfully sunny afternoon, descend from the mountain, and have a day out. The Aisa bathhouse in the city, Hanamizaki's Kiminama restaurant, Ogura textiles and kimonos by the street side. She did not miss a single store, and everyone was an enjoyable experience. And, in the evening, she was at Bantan Sango Detective Agency to tell them of missing animals case that she heard about on the way. But you really must help good detectives. I mean, one can barely stand to watch those owners cry their hearts out as it is. Having done all this, the lady could not help but let slip a pleased smile. Taking part in Inazuma's daily life in such an identity really was fun. Well, except that part where Kujusara shot her a suspicious glance they passed each other by. Right, and also she probably owed the boss of Ice Up Bathhouse an apology. The Outland-styled hot springs were indeed very good, but she might have accidentally shed some fox fur during the soak. A long, long time ago, humanity did not need to use the phrase a long, long time ago to preface tales about yokai. The Tengu dominated the skies. The Oni swept through the battlefields. The Tanuki were seen across small paths, and the Kitsune walked amongst humans. Under the banner of Narukami, the incredible powers of the yokai host were used to help humans through an era of strife and poverty. Seeking refuge in the mountains, they built a city by the sea, and so began Inazuma. Amongst the yokai, the lineage of the Hakushin Kitsune was the most revered, and it was this great line that left a great many tales amongst humans. Whenever the yokai gathered to feast and soup together, 
a little braggadocio about how their latest exploits had become legend anew was very much a given. Of course, considering the amount they would drink, most tales told afterward would diverge a little from the truth. But no one minded, asking only that the tale be interesting. As time passed, this became known as Hayumukatari Daikai, or the great meaning of a hundred tales. It was no uncommon sight to see Urasaki raise his cup and speak, holding all the other yokai spellbound with the story, drawing even smiles from Kitsune Saigu, the organizer of the event. Instead, it was Miko, who was then in the form of a young Kitsune, who would perch on Kitsune Saigu's shoulder and relentlessly peck at any loopholes in Urasaki's story. Urasaki, being a cool-headed and brilliant gentleman, would explain as he twirled his beard. But Miko could always find something new to nitpick, and so they would go, back and forth, until Lady Saigo would smile and call both parties to a halt. The audience wanted to hear the next part, after all. After another three rounds of drink and several more rounds of stories, the company would be hard-pressed to even string a sentence together, let alone a story. And so, the gathered yokai would dispense with the word fencing, and use their powers to take the skies to see who could best cover the sky and moon with their powers. And thus, it was said that a hundred yokai shall parade upon a moonless night. Five hundred years on, that little Katsune has already become a mighty yokai in her own right. As for the yokai who drank with them in those days, they disappeared amidst war and history, and their remaining bloodlines grow thinner by the day. And thus did their great parade, the Hayaki Yuko, become something that happened a long, long time ago. The swords of Inazuma have always been famous the world over, and the best works of the Raiden Gakuden in particular are national treasures. However, only a short time ago, more than half of the five artisan lineages were cut off. A great number of powerful people were caught up in that conspiracy, and those responsible were all called to account and banished. Even the Yashiro Commission's Kamisato clan was implicated due to their failure in supervising their subordinates. But before the Shogun could give her final judgment, the Lady Guji, who usually did not meddle in governmental affairs, suddenly interceded, rescuing the Kamisato clan in their hour of peril. Thus, while they suffered a serious blow, they were spared from dismissal. In the years that followed, others would speculate greatly concerning the Guji's actions. Some observed the close relations between the Yashiro Commission and the Grand Naokabi Shrine, and guessed that she had always intended to foster advocates loyal to her. And yet the shrine had always been an entity unto itself, and the Lady Guji did not usually meddle in governance. Thus, this action seemed a sacrifice greater than the reward, hardly a wise decision. Some others said that the Guji suspected something to be wrong with the whole situation, and now that the list of those involved was so extensive, any major shakeup in the Yashiro Commission could destabilize Inazuma itself. This thought too seemed reasonable on face, yet did not stand up to scrutiny. After all, was not the rise and fall of great houses merely ordinary in the grand scheme of mortal affairs? And even if the Kamisato were to fall from grace, new leadership for the Yashiro Commission would emerge. Yet another story said that Miko engaged in secret talks with the Kamisato clan head just after the initial shockwaves had died down. But the wounded clan was like a candle in the wind at this point. What power could they have to change the situation? To this day, all these speculations have never amounted to anything, nor have any answers emerged concerning Miko's actions and motivations. But what one none know is how Miko's words that day would become as engraved into the Kamisato clan as their house's crest. That the Kamisato clan has survived this incident is only due to the Shogun's mercy. Do not forget this in the days that follow. These words would serve as a seed of destiny foreshadowing the Yashiro Commission's future position. In some other time, if a storm were to descend upon Inazuma, and even if they were to come into conflict with the other two commissions, the Yashiro Commission's Kamisato clan would remember the favor they were shown, 
and abide the Shogun's path to eternity. This was a move that the Guji played with no regrets whatsoever. The Fire Soothing Festival Committee was once an organization chaired by the Tenryo Commission and managed by the Grand no Okami Shrine, whose remit was to pray for a lack of any fires in the coming year. In those days, Inazuma houses were mostly made of wood, and any carelessness while handling fire could lead to disaster. Thus, the Tenryo Commission was charged by the Shogun with setting up fire brigades to conduct rescues and damage controls when fires did break out. And they also requested that the Grand Narukami Shrine set the Fire Soothing Festival Committee up to comfort the frightening people. In later years, anti-fire precautions would become second nature, and serious cases would no longer occur often, but still the annual festival would remain. The shrine maidens would dance elegantly, and the people would give generously, with the proceeds split 40-60 between the commission and the shrine. When Yai Miko was faced with financial issues while attempting to start Yai Publishing House, she considered the various services that the shrine ran at the time before locking onto this ancient traditional committee. I mean, the busy work is solely done by the Grand Narukami Shrine, so why do we have to split the proceeds with the Tenryo Commissions? What's more, all that more is just going to Kujo Sr.'s pockets. It's not like the Fire Brigade has ever gotten a year-end bonus or anything. As such, after some preparation, the Fire Soothing Festival of that year would be changed to no longer feature dancing shrine maidens, but a grand, rollicking light novel submission contest. The organizing body for this competition and any subsequent publications, the I Publishing House, would also borrow the Fire Soothing Festival Committee's budget. As for the profits, into the shrine's coffers they went. Well, we no longer have many fires, and yet our budget keeps increasing. Thus, this restructuring relieves the financial burden placed upon the people. Also, the study of lore and the writing of literature and poetry is also a way of pleasing our Archon. Surely you do not claim to know more of ritual and ceremony than I. That was what Yai Miko said most solemnly to Kujo Kakuyuki when he came by unannounced. The Tenryo Commissioner was ultimately forced to leave the way he came, stormy-faced, along with his attendants. Little did any of them know that the moment they stepped out of the shrine, the somber Lady Miko would pluck a novel manuscript from the nearby offering box and continue annotating it. That was a contest of magic for the ages! The foe split the seas as they strode across the skies, heaven and earth changing hue as they approached. Gohei in hand, the Lady Guji was solemn as she strode up Mount Yogo. All around her the shrine maids chanted their mantras as the clouds masked the sun, the thunder waiting within for the moment to strike. The battle was a grinding, protracted affair. In time, even the Guji began to falter, and the enemy seized that opening, lashing out with great force. Just then, a bolt of lightning descended like a falling star before the Guji, a glimmering vision. Grasping it in her hand, the revivified Guji showed forth her power and... Now, just wait a minute. None of what you said just said happened, right? Hmm, well, how about this then? It all started the day when I had a most vicious ramen duel down in Hanamizaka. Oh, come on, nobody's ever gotten a vision from eating ramen. But wouldn't that be interesting? I mean, these are the sorts of stories you like to hear, right? Yai Miko gave a thin, enigmatic smile as she was faced with the Traveler's curiosity. After all, would you believe me if I said that my vision is purely ornamental, just for show, little one? Hardly. Not even if it were the truth. And those are all of Yai Miko's stories. She appears throughout the Inazuma Archon quests, has her own story quest, and has appeared in the recent Hues of the Violet Garden event. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you all in the next video.